All right, ladies and gentlemen, all kinds of fun today trying to get the equipment here in the studio going. Um, but here we are, a little late. You are listening to WZRD Chicago, 88.3 FM, WZRDChicago.org for streaming around the world and beyond. And uh, we're happening now. We're on the air. We have the esteemed... Monsignor Jonathan Edward Cerebrus Aloysius Kelman with us today, Esquire, journalist, I'm afraid he's not here. <laughs> journalist from All About Jazz, yes indeed, and yes. how you doing, John? Uh, I'm good, how about you? Happy New Year, it was a good start right here, I hope this isn't an indication of what's to come. Oh goodness, yes indeed. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so we're happening. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you as always, man. Uh, what we're doing today, folks, is John. For those of you who know or don't know, is the one of the head journalists at uh, All About Jazz, an online publication where you can find all kinds of wonderful music information, and it does go beyond jazz. And at the end of the year, John did his picks for the best of the year. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. We're also going to say goodbye to a wonderful guitarist and musician, Vic Juris. And uh, when John and I are done talking, um, which should be sometime Tuesday or Thursday, because uh, we tend to talk a bit, uh, we'll listen to some stuff that we talk about. So, John, let's get started with um, maybe some of the sad news. We lost a guitarist that you have turned me on to, Mr. Vic Juris. Yeah, Vic, um that's a hard one for me because I knew Vic. Um, I met him a number of times when he was in Ottawa playing with, uh, well, he did a workshop, a guitar workshop here. He did a gig with a local bassist, John Giggy, who had a series for a long time uh, where he kind of brought people in without a safety net. And he also played, I saw him here uh, a couple of times with Dave Liebman. Vic is... A guitarist. Uh, he played in uh, saxophonist Dave Liebman's uh, group for over 20 years. Dave Liebman, for those who don't know him, is a monumental saxophonist who seems to put out more albums per year than many people do in their lifetime. He first came to big fame playing with Miles Davis in the early 70s, but he's moved on to many, many other things. Anyway, Vic played with, with Dave, and you know, I, uh, this is hard because, you know, I knew Vic and he was a guitarist who absolutely, and this is not hyperbole, uh, stands, stood at, as all the big guitar gods alive today, like Bill Frizzell, John Schofield, Pat Metheny, uh, the late John Abercrombie. In fact, if there's any guitar player that Vic kind of uh, is closest to, it would be Abercrombie. Uh, largely, I'm hearing ticking. Is that okay? Uh, I'm okay. I am hooking up um, something on the computer that we're talking through. Is it still happening? Okay, uh, I don't hear it now. So oh. can I go ahead? Yeah, please. You're fine. Okay, yeah. sorry. So yeah, so so Vic, you know, is but but he never. Uh, there are some musicians who never really aspire to the kind of you know, broad exposure and acclaim, and yet Vic was, you know, a musician's musician, you know. I mean, he may not have been a household name even amongst jazz fans, but talk to any musician, especially in New York, and, like, they know who he is and how great he is. And the reason I compare him to Abercrombie is because he, um, you know, as much as I love Matheny, Frizzell, and Schofield, and I do, they're amongst my favorite alive guys, along with some of the people we'll talk about today on my best of list. But um, one of the things about Abercrombie that always impresses me, or impre well, still does, I shouldn't say past tense, is yeah. that he doesn't have any kind of signature things that he does that make him sound like him. Whereas, you know, Matheny certainly does, um, and Schofield does. So anyway, so Abercrombie, he's a, he's a motivic improviser, meaning that he grabs onto a small, say, musical phrase and then expands upon that, and then that leads to something else on which he expands. Vic is very much, uh, was in the, same, in the same ballpark, but the difference between Vic and John is that Vic could play 
anything. I, I mean anything. He could play flamenco guitar. He could play rock and roll. He could play fusion. He could play straight ahead. He could play anything. And I've been following him since the mid-90s with Liebman. And his growth as a guitar player is just spectacular. So his loss at a really young age, I didn't check how old he was, but I only think he was a couple of years older than me. Uh, he was suffering from uh, cancer for some time. And on Christmas Day, he posted a picture of himself um, bundled up in uh, blankets on a chair with a, a lovely acoustic nylon string guitar that his partner, Kate, uh, given to him. And in retrospect, I kind of think this was his goodbye to people because uh, he only died uh, on the evening of the 30th into the 31st of December. Anyway, he's a tremendous loss, and for anybody who doesn't know him, uh, I'm going to recommend a handful of records that you should check out. Two by him, they're very different. One is called um, Blue Horizon. It's on Zoho, and it's from 2004 or five with the great Joe Locke on vibes, Jamie Haddad on percussion, uh, Jay Anderson bass, Adam Nussbaum and drums, and Vic called it his Sgt. Peppers because it's a very conceptual record, um, but it's a jazz record. That's an amazing one. And the can other we, one is a more recent one. On give me the Steve name of that first. Sorry to interrupt. Give me the name of that first one again, man. Uh, Blue Horizon. Okay. And the other one is a more recent one from around 2011 on Steeplechase, which is where most of his albums were released. And it's called Omega is the Alpha. And it's it's with Jay Anderson and Adam Nussbaum, who are his kind of regular guys for a rhythm section. Um, and with Dave Liebman, you know, there's a couple. I mean, he did a many, many records with him, but two that stand out for me are Conversations from 2003 on Sunnyside, because uh, it's got some great writing by Vic along with his playing. And um, one of the last ones they released, which is called Turnaround, the music of Ornette Coleman, which is a very unusual album because Ornette rarely played with chordal instruments. And, of course, Liebman, in this case, had, you know, guitar, bass, and drums, so we had a chordal guy. But it's a tremendous record. And those are four that would give you a good idea about what Vic is about. Um, well, I was listening yesterday to the... Uh... I heard almost the whole album conversation, the Liebman album. I love that album. Oh. And uh, I think, I don't know if uh, Vic co-wrote or not, but he's featured heavily on uh, a track called Soft Spoken that I thought I was going to play. Uh, yeah, well, let me check. I, I, I have to, I, I don't quite remember, but let me just check. Uh, I just want to see, because I think, I mean, I know he did contribute some writing to it, uh, so I'm not sure uh if, if he wrote that track but just just give me a minute uh i will find it uh if the bleeding okay hang on a sec uh anyway we should keep talking because i'm going to go look for the album right now um in my boxes of cds but i can find it very quickly believe it or not because i'm an alphabetically organized guy uh but i do have a boat just going through your uh, your list uh, the last couple days preparing for our show today. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you for turning me on to a lot of stuff, man. Um, yeah. Good stuff. My pleasure. My, listen, I, my biggest problem doing lists is that, you know, like I can't do a top 10. I can't do a top 20. I just, you know, I can't do a top list. So I just basically go for all the things that I can think of that have really been important to me in a particular year. And even so, uh, there are a couple that got away and there are a couple that people might question, um, particularly in the non jazz section. Um, you know, the band reissue of their second album, uh, was a monumentally important reissue, but just like the big pink one, I did not like the remix. Um, I don't think that what they're doing with the remix is it's losing the kind of murkiness that is so endemic to those records. Two albums that should have been on it were Dylan's latest bootleg series, which covers the sort of period 
uh, Nashville skyline around that era with a lot of duo recordings with Johnny Cash. And it's just a small set this time, a three CD set, and it's amazing. And the other one, which I got too late, is the Zappa Hot Rat Sessions, which is for anybody who loves process and wants to hear how that album came to be, um, this six CD box is just like manna from heaven. Um, I don't know if you've heard this yet, uh, Brian. I have not heard any of the Hot Rat Sessions yet, no. Um <sighs> But, man, I, I do love that album, and I would love to hear, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of the name of the last track, is that It Must Be a Camel? Yes. I would uh, love to hear outtakes of that, because he has two bars of some of my favorite music by anybody in there. dun 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 and then it's over. <laughs> well, there is all, there, that's, that, is, that is Zappa, you know? Lots of surprises, but that's a great track, and I mean... In addition to, it's not just alternate takes, it's also developing. Like they have Peaches on Regalia, and it begins, which is the opening track in the album, it begins with Ian Underwood doing a solo piano kind of thing. Uh, he was really instrumental in this record. That is what emerges probably most dominantly on this box set, is how important Ian Underwood was. But then, you know, there are, starts and stops as Zappa gives instructions, uh, sometimes uh, encouragement, sometimes discouragement. Uh, and it's just, so it's really, you really feel like you're in the studio watching these guys do this. I love that. Um, I love that kind and, of stuff. Hey, me too. And I eat it up. And, and this box set, I mean, I just, I've picked up three Zappa box sets in the last month. I picked up the Hollywood, or sorry, Halloween 73 and 77, and this. And, I mean, the Halloween ones are fun, but this is serious shit, man. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, this is serious. This is serious stuff. Um, it's, it's uh, plus there's a lot of tunes that, that kind of end up in bits and pieces elsewhere. Some end up nowhere. There are lengthy jams, like 32 minutes long. It's just loaded with stuff. But anyway, uh, Liebman, by the way, you are extremely on the money, man, because both the only two, there's three tracks in the album that aren't written by Liebman. One is a track called uh, Shorty George. It's also Vic. Oh, and the opening the track. track. That is fantastic. He wrote that too? He did. Oh, I love and that it, track. And indeed, he wrote Soft Spoken. Okay, because so I, I, as I remember, it's almost a duet. I mean, there is a full ensemble, but we'll hear it later. I think it's almost a duet between the guitar and, I want to say, the bass player. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, you know, before we leave the Zappa thing real quickly, um, are there outtakes <laughs> of, um, God, I'm drawing a lot of blanks this morning, the, the one with Beefheart. Um, oh, yeah. Well, uh, Willie, Willie the, the Pimp. Pimp. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, I, Oh, yeah. I mean, this is six CDs. There are effectively, uh, one second here. I'm just going to bring it up on my uh, iTunes because I've got it ripped there in full format, of course. Um, just have to say that. Um, there's basically um, almost five hours of session stuff. And then there's an additional two discs that are called From the Vault and they include the 1987 remix, which was controversial, but now if you've got the original mix, you can compare the two. Plus, it's got, you know, promotional ads uh, and assorted other stuff. Um, but um, like Willie the Pimp, for example, there are, I think it's only this many. Yeah, there's there's four tracks, but like it totals for, uh, for almost 40 minutes. Um you know, so one is an un, is a, is a, as an in session uh, take. Another one's an unedited master take. So you get to hear the thing before it was chopped. Um, and then there's two guitar overdub tracks. Uh, so you get to hear Zappa doing different things on guitar. And of course, at the same time, Captain Beefheart is doing some you know weird vocalizing as well. Um, so there's, I mean, there is, uh, pretty much, you know, a number of takes or starts and stop takes of every track on the album. Are the, are the lyrics any different? 
with the beat uh, with Willie the Pimp? Honestly, I don't. I've only listened to it twice. Uh, okay, and I'm not sure. I can't say. Can't Just say. curious. Um, yeah. All right. So since we since we moved over to the Zappa box and uh, the band, uh, why don't we, uh, if you don't mind, a uh, couple box set, other box sets that made your list: uh, the Gentle Giant, Unburied Treasure, the Gong, Ooh. Love from the Planet Gong, and Pink Floyd, The Later Years. What you got for okay. us, man? Well. I mean, the, the, of, of the three, um, sorry, there was the Giant, there was the Floyd, and what was the other one? A uh, little group called Gong. Ah, Gong, of course. Well, it's a toss-up. Um, I mean, the Gong is spectacular. Um, you know, it's the best-sounding version of their Flying Teapot or Radio Gnome Invisible trilogy, whatever you want to call it. Um the three albums that they did, um, Angels, uh, um, Flying Teapot, Angels, Egg, and You, plus Jamal, which was a transitional album um, uh, into the sort of more uh, instrumental group they'd become. But anyway, it's a great box, and the live performances, especially the one from the Shamal group with Steve Hillage, is mind-boggling. But the Gentle Giant kind of has to top my list because it's a career-spanning box, that as much as the remasters of all their studio and one commercially released live album are, and they're very, very good, uh, and as great as Stephen Wilson's unexpected uh, remix of the first Gentle Giant album from 1970 is, and it very much is, to me this box was about documenting Gentle Giant as a touring band because there are samples of shows from 1971 through 1980 barring um, 1977, but there's rehearsals in there. And um, I think 1979, they didn't play. So, and some of them are audience recordings, which I'm usually kind of mm, about, but they've been cleaned up well enough. And just in context with everything else, they're important because Gentle Giant, uh, for those who don't know the band, was a really extraordinary group that really that never became as big as I think they could should have um, but the reason they didn't probably was because like they were you know if yes and they were second Palmer and Pink Floyd and you know even King Crimson were doing things um, that were you know very innovative um, General Giant was doing things that were both innovative and largely until about halfway through the career, not particularly uh, appealing to a broader audience because they were really weird. I mean, Counterpoint was huge with the band. A big influence was uh, Renaissance music, Baroque era, Renaissance era. Um, and, you know, these guys were all multi-instrumentalists, so live, it was like slate of hand. Uh, one minute you're watching the whole band, the next minute you've got an acoustic guitar duo going on, suddenly there's, uh, you know, a guitar ba or a bass drums and vibes on the right, and they constantly yeah. shift, and this is all within one song. Um, so anyway, the, the Unburied Treasure Box, beyond the music and the live performances, there are eight audience, and there are eight that are either soundboard or properly mixed uh, uh, multi-tracks, um, plus a little short BBC session that's also good quality. Um, aside from documenting how General Giant would alter the material live, um, some things that they did in the studio couldn't be translated live, so instead of trying to do it, they rearrange songs really radically. Uh, an example being um, the track on Reflection from Freehand, 1975. And that's a track that's got, like, another thing that's very, sim you know, what they do. Um, remarkable vocal harmonies and counterpoint within. They had very complex uh, vocals. And that that would um, you know be could be unison, could be harmony, could be counterpoint, or all those things at once. Um, so it has that. It's got a section where I think four of the guys in the band are playing recorders. Um, it it in, it's a really bizarre and complex 
uh, Renaissance informed tune, and they couldn't do it live the way they do it in the studio, so they changed it. And they've done that with they did that with a lot of music. They also built medleys, like they built a complete medley uh, from their fourth album, Octopus, from seventy three or seventy two, seventy three, that uh, you know brought together. I think uh, one, two, uh, three, four, um, four of the eight songs on the album, uh, but in different contexts. Um, so anyway, so the album, so the music is tr tremendous, but on top of that, this is a heavy duty box, 30, 29 CDs, one Blu-ray. It's got a 136 page hardcover book. That's like a historical bio type book of the band, which really is necessary because there's only been one book before about the band by a guy, by a guy named Paul Stump. And it wasn't, sorry, Paul, not that, it wasn't that good. Uh, and then there's a 96-page softcover book, also 12 by 12, coffee table size, where another guy basically goes through their touring history uh, and refers to the recordings in the box, but also to many other things. Um, so it's uh, and there's lots of little goodies as well. A missing piece jigsaw puzzle with you know a missing piece for their uh, 1977 album called The Missing Piece. There's the Giant for a Day mask from the only album that most people would say was awful by General Giant um, because they were trying to become more commercial in the face of punk, new wave, and just the way the music was going uh, in 78, and they failed abysmally. But they bounced back in 80 with Civilian, and that album, if it had been released at a different time, maybe, or by a different band that didn't have the I hate to don't mean it in a negative way, baggage. That album could have been a bigger thing for them. Anyway, so the box set has got a lot in it. Um, you know, 30 discs, hardcover coffee table book, soft cover coffee table book, with more information about Giant than you're ever going to find anywhere else. And it's not cheap. Um, it was originally limited to 2,000 copies, but because it sold out so quickly and because, unfortunately, and I'm going to say this here, you know, there are people who buy these box sets hoping to put them out of print so that they can then put them up on eBay or whatever for like ridiculously inflated prices. And so uh, Madfish did something that they have never done before in my knowledge of them, and that's they announced a second um, pressing of 1,000 copies that will be out in April. It's 250 pounds, which is a lot of money but you get a lot for the money. Um, so that's my thing about Giant, and I went on a long time there. Let's go to Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd, on the other hand, it's a great box, especially for somebody who's not a pathological Floyd freak. Um, the real nitty-gritty guys have problems with it for a variety of reasons. Um, it's an 18-disc box. It's got five CDs. Um... It's uh, which have a remix, a complete remix of a momentary lapse of reason, their 1987 uh, album, studio album. But that was a weird album because um, Richard Wright didn't, their keyboard player didn't participate much on it. Nick Mason, was, the drummer, wasn't feeling very comfy, so he did a lot of electronics and some drums, but mostly it was session guys like Tony Levin on bass because they didn't. Uh, Roger Waters anymore, and Tony was certainly a great choice. But also, they used you know other drummers. And you know, it's um, funny that uh, the rhythm section for that album ended up being. Uh, I mean, I'm not s s sure what tracks the drummers played on. I think yeah. Kel Keltner's on there, but I think Andy Newmark was on there too. And uh, uh, Carmen Apici. Okay, and the, the, uh, Newmark and Levin were the rhythm section for Double Fantasy. So, you know, I mean, it, it was great, but it but it was sort of kind of not sounding like Floyd. And it was also, it was very, very much buried down in a lot of 80s production um, tropes that, 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 you know, may have sounded great at the time, but sound kind of, you know, dated now. So what they did was they brought in more of the keyboards that Richard Wright did. And, they, and Nick Mason actually literally recorded new drum tracks for a lot of the stuff. Um, so that's one CD. There's two CDs of an expanded uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder, which was their live 
concert video of two hours, but they had an accompanying live double disc set that was just, you know, at the time, it was also a two LP set, so it was short. It was about yeah, 85, 90 minutes. This is like two and a half hours almost, and it's pretty much pretty much everything they played until a guy com uh, uh, corrected me, um, a Floyd geek, and thank God there are those guys out there to keep me honest. Um, it played everything except <laughs> for Echoes, which was the opening song for the first 11 gigs, after which they swapped it out for the usual Shine On, You Crazy Diamond. Um, so there's, that's one, two, and three. The next two discs are, uh, the first, the, the disc four is a bunch of live tracks that were B-sides to single releases, um, from, uh, both A Momentary Lapse of Reason in 1994 uh, is The Division Bell, um, and, um, also a bunch of outtakes from The Division Bell, which are kind of interesting simply because they actually used a lot of outtakes from the Division Bell to fashion um, Pink Floyd's final record, The Endless River, that was released in 2014, and barring one song was all instrumental and was really meant to kind of focus a good spotlight on Richard Wright, who had passed away in 2008. Um, so then the last disc is the Nebworth concert, which is... Um, a heralded show they did in the pouring rain um and you know uh, it's good but it's i'm not sure how you know comparably it is compared like you know with dark with delicate sound of thunder um because it was recorded in 1990 at a show at a, at, at nebworth um the then there are six blu-rays and five dvds the five dvds mirror blu-rays two to six so i'm gonna uh, just talk about the Blu-rays. The first one is high-resolution surround and stereo of the Momentary Lapse of Reason remix, um, plus the 2014 uh, revision to the Division Bell. Uh, then there is the uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder film, which has been remixed and re-edited, and it looks spectacular because it was record it was taped to film. Um, Pulse is also included on the next disc, and it's not so good. I mean, it's good, but Delicate Sound, Sound of Thunder is widescreen, crystal clear. Pulse, the live album that they recorded from their Division Bell tour in 95, was, or 94, was um, recorded to VHS tape, which was becoming the thing at the time. And it leaves them with less uh, capacity to do things. And so it's um, like it's television screen ratio, four to three. Um, and it's not as crystal crisp, but the sound has been redone and it sounds really good. Um, then there are, there's a disc of assorted musical odds and ends, including four, uh, five previously unreleased video tracks from the Delicate Sound of Thunder tour that were all from the A Momentary Lapse of Reason album plus uh, four no, three rehearsal tracks from the, uh, the Division Bell tour, um, and assorted other things like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, um, the Sid Barrett tribute, Sid Barrett being the original singer and guitarist for the band who got so heavily into drugs and mental health issues that David Gilmore came in first to augment him and then ultimately had to replace him. Anyway, so there's a truth. So then the last... TV or Blu-ray is a sort of documentaries and you know the screen films from their shows. They always used to have like a round screen behind them, and many of the songs had um, films by a variety of people. Many of them by Storm Thurgerson, who was one half of Hypnosis, who also did most of their covers. So there's also documentaries about the covers, assorted stuff, um, all great stuff. And the screen films are interesting because I mean they're full you know, widescreen films, um, you know, and, and you get to see the entire thing and it's, it's anyway, so there's good stuff. And, but the problem with Floyd is, you know, it's a lush box. It's better than the early years box in the sense that the early years box, you open it up and like 50% of it was literally air. There was, you know, it was a much bigger box than it needed to be. This one feels like it's bursting at the seams. 
It's um, got a 60-page hardcover coffee table size photo book, which is really lovely. And, you know, it's got all sorts of other things like tour programs and, uh, you know, the usual odds and ends. But, you know, just like the early years box, it really lacked the kind of, they could have done text, had somebody write, you know, somebody like David Fricky or something write liners um, or something. And, I mean, I know there have been a lot of books published about Floyd, but surely there's new perspectives that could have been brought to this box set. So that's my big complaint. And most people complain that there's CDs or Blu-rays and DVDs that are the same. My comment about that is, you know, you can't please everybody. I mean, one thing that people should know out there is that when people try to make box sets, you know, they try to figure out what's the best way to present it that will appeal to the greatest number of fans. So there are people who still don't have Blu-ray. So they needed to put the DVDs in there. They didn't do the uh, high res, the, the, the high res mixes of a momentary lapse of reason because DVDs don't have this enough storage capacity to have done that. But the point being that, you know, for those people who are adamant DVD guys, and they are because, like, I will not buy a Blu-ray player. I'm not going to buy my stuff a second time kind of thing. And I guess I get it. Anyway, so they needed to have them in both formats. You know, some people say, why didn't they release two different box, one Blu-ray, one DVD? Well, the cost of doing that, and, you know, it's, you just can't please everybody. So, you know, for the people who are complaining about the number of discs and the format of discs, I'd kind of say, with all due respect, get a life. My big complaint is that it's a very expensive box. It's something like $450 US or something. See, and I think that's the thing, man. If, if you can afford a $450 box, I yeah. think you can probably afford a $50 Blu-ray player. That's my view. You know, but there are people who, are, who do buy these things, and they are absolute. It's like it's like they're militant about it, and I don't mean any disrespect, but you know, I mean, heck, I'm at 4K now. I mean, like I'm buying 4K media. I'd have loved to have seen Delicate Sound of Thunder, you know, remat remastered the film in 4K. You know. Oh yeah, I want to. Wanna... Let me interrupt real quick. I just want to. No, that's that's about. All. I mean, that's really what I wanted to say about the floor. I mean, it's a great box for latter period Floyd fans and it is a lovely box. It's got and it's got a lot in it. It's just expensive. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in um I've been reading some threads about this over at the Steve Hoffman forum and at Progressive mm -hmm. Ears. Yeah. And folks are wondering why uh Welcome to the Machine isn't on the uh video but it's on the audio for uh, delicate sound of thunder i think i remember reading a long time ago that waters owns the gerald scarf or however you pronounce the gentleman's name i think he owns all that animation so i think now i i don't want to spread wrong information but i think that's why it's not on the delicate sound of thunder film that could be but also don't forget they didn't record like every show they recorded one show um and, you know, maybe there was a problem with, with, with the video recorder at the time, you know, with the, with the, yeah. you know, like there are many possible reasons why I have not heard anything. So, you know, we can speculate, but that's about all we can do. Um, I, I hope you folks are digging this. This is some very in-depth uh, look at these releases and w with knowledge behind it. So I hope oh, that... I'm sorry. I babble on, I, you know. Interrupt at will, you know. Oh the, no, no, no. We, we, we uh, one of our mottos at the Wizard is Babylon. Okay. Um, so let's um, let's talk a little bit about some of these releases that are individual albums that you had on your top ten list, both jazz mm -hmm. and beyond jazz. And sure. I just want to add one. Yep. Uh, the Claypool London album. The what, which one? The Claypool London. Um, oh my! I don't even know that one. What was that one called? God, I am really spacing out today. Um, <laughs> it started with... S South of Reality. Okay. Uh, that's that that with. album is... I, I just think what Claypool London are doing are just... Uh, All right. And for I those will. of you who are listening who have tried Sean London and not found stuff that you loved, i got to admit, I've heard some Sean London stuff years and years ago. 
it didn't turn me off, but it didn't grab me either. But if you hear his ghost of a saber-toothed tiger with his girlfriend and this uh, Claypool Lennon stuff, what a melodic writer. Uh, what a great, great guitar player. Anyway. Um, I, will, I will buy this as soon as I'm off the phone with you. <laughs> oh, oh, God, man, believe hey, me. You're going to love no, it. No. If, it's, if, you, if you're recommending it, I'm in. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I want to talk uh, first about some of these releases that you have on your list that I went hunting around for <laughs> that really grabbed me. So I'm going to list one, two, three, four, five of these. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean the rest of the stuff on your list I don't want to talk about. It no. also doesn't mean I didn't like it. I just couldn't find it handily. Of course. And, and I will raise a few that as probably as well after you're finished with your five. But go Okay. Ahead. Well, the Mark Copeland, and I love her. Um, the Bill Frisell and Thomas Morgan, Epistrophe, which is weird because, God, one of these other albums, the first track is called Epistrophe. I think, is it the Steve Kahn patchwork? I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, might be. He might, I, I can't, he did, he always does a monk tune. Okay, um, okay, there you go. I wanted to talk about the Steve Kahn album as well. And, uh, Two bands that uh, I keep hearing their names. One of them I might have played last year, but I forgot about. Is, yep, and uh, big big train. Thank you, man. Oh. Thank you. So go. What do you got to say about that stuff? Because you turned me onto the stuff, and I thank you for it. Okay. Well, I mean, I I I learned about is through. <clears throat> um, I was approached by actually two publishers in or two eight book agents in England in not 2014 uh about doing like a real progressive rock history book a big one like a tome you know six seven hundred pages um and I was really starting to I mean we were putting together I had picked an agent and we were putting together kind of a a, a general outline and things and then I got sick um, for those who don't know, I have chronic fatigue syndrome, which is uh, I manage fine and I could be a lot worse, but it slows me down. And the idea of doing a book from scratch just became an impossibility. So, but at the time when it was still on the go, I was reaching out to a pile of bands just saying, listen, you know, I'm going to be doing this. And from what I've read and heard, I think you guys should be here. Can you send me anything? And is sent me a number of records and I just, I just love them. They're very, I mean, they're, they're, they're now called mm, I think modern prog instead of neo prog, but you know, we're splitting hairs here. Yes. Figures into them quite a bit, but I think the things, one of the things that really lifts them is that they've got two male and two female vocalists and their harmonies are truly celestial. Um, big, big train. That was another one. Um, David Longden, the, primary writer or one of the primary writers and flautist vocalist um and sort of mover and shaker um sent me some of their early stuff and i had heard english electric which was i think 2014 originally released as two eps but then brought together um and you know the thing that uh, uh, the two a number of things appeal to me okay now we're going to be doing monty python amongst the many things that appeal to me i'll start again um, <laughs> coming again Come in again. Yes, uh, it's not the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, anyway, uh, the things that got, or they are unapologetically, unabashedly, and absolutely a British band. Um, I mean, they write about British subjects oftentimes. They, you know, they're just, they're quintessentially British. And, but at the same time, they've got, I, at the, the band has grown over the years, and their current band, which has been together now for largely, you know, they just lost one person, but since 2014, includes Nick the Virgilio, who is the drummer and originally backup and then lead singer for Spock's Beard, an American band. Um, it also has Dave Gregory, the guitar player from XTC, who is amazing, and a guy who I love, Ricard Sjoblom. He is a guitarist, keyboardist, and singer whose first sort of appearance was in a band called Beardfish, um, a Swedish band whose first album was in Swedish, but after that they went English. And they were 
both musically deep and stunningly hilarious at the same time. So, you know, just those three guys alone are reason to be interested in Big Big Train. But the thing is, they've been on a roll since English Electric, which the thing about it is that um, it it's a, it, they can do everything from like long form progressive epic stuff to pop songs like the opening track on English Electric makes some noise it's it i hope it was a single i don't know if it was but it's a you know it should be anyway but since 2016 they have been or i guess 2015 they've been really busy um they've released three live albums um, which are like double disc sets. Uh, they've released uh, one, two, a three, four uh, studio albums, full-length studio albums, including the one I picked from this year called The Grand Tour, or called Grand Tour, not the, uh, but also EPs, including Swan Hunter. They did a thing where they took a bunch of songs about London and they sewed them together in the studio and released it as London song. So, I mean, they've been busy and they're touring in the UK uh, to great acclaim. And the great news is they're coming to North America for their very first time this year. They'll be playing Ross Fest in May, but they are talking about adding other dates in the US and also Canada. So, you're looking at a guy whose fingers and toes and any other thing I can cross are crossed that they'll come somewhere near where I am. And they, if they make it to Canada, they'll make it, they'll probably play Montreal. That would be their probably first and best choice. Yeah. I'm hoping they, um, they come to Chicago. I just want to remind yeah. our listeners since we're at the top of the hour, you're listening to WZRD Chicago, 88.3 FM. Yeah, I hope they come to Chicago, and I hope yeah. they come to your neck of the woods, too, man. But the thing that makes them great is because they've got so much, you know, like, they have so much instrumentation at their disposal because they have everything from the conventional, you know, guitars, keys, bass, drums, um, and multiples thereof, because, um, you know, guys like Slope, the original key, the regular, their, nor their first keyboard player, uh, he's there but also seal blown can play keys so you know there's that but they also have a violinist they have a, a flute from david longdon um i guess the de facto leader and you know so the flute and his voice which is very kind of gabriel-esque um so they do have a tendency at times to sound genesis -y, um for a new word but at the same time, you know, they're very, very distinctive. And, and they're one of them, they were one of the big finds for me when I was doing the research uh, for the book that didn't come to pass. That was like one of my big finds. So I'm glad I hit you to them. Well, that's one of the things I loved about them and is as well. A lot of the stuff that's called modern Prague for the last 20 years, um, I won't name names, but everybody says, listen to this, listen to that, and I, the songs aren't there. The, the the songs aren't there. Yes, and all the bands we think of as progressive from the 70s, yeah, they went way out on a limb, but they never stopped having the songs. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I also would like, since you mentioned a couple of the jazz things, I think I really feel like I need to mention a couple of them. Uh, Mark Copeland I've been a fan of for I don't know, three decades now. He's an interesting guy because Mark Copeland started out as a saxophonist and his original name was actually Mark Cohen. Um, so he's a brother. and um, But he began playing piano and, you know, suddenly that was his instrument. It was clear. I mean, as a saxophonist, he was good, but he wasn't a standout. As a pianist, he's one of the most... Um, sensitive, delicate pianists around. His harmonic sense is very sophisticated. So if he takes a jazz standard that you might know, you know, really well, it will sound um, so reinvented just harmonically, let alone anything else he does. This album is, is his first Trio album in a while, and I mean, for a long period of time, Trio was what he did. Um, and this is the same 
two guys that play with him in bassist Gary Peacock's, well, no, sorry, one of them plays in with him in bassist Gary Peacock's trio, and the, and the two of them played with Mark Copeland in John Abercrombie's Last Quartet, and that would be bassist Drew Gress and Joey Barron, drummer, who started off as known for guys like Bill Frizzell and John Zorn and stuff. Anyway, the Copeland album is exactly what you expect it to be, but that doesn't mean it's predictable. It just means, you know, the guy's use of pedals is unparalleled. Uh, I mean, I've seen him play numerous times, and, you know, again, another guy I know, and and uh, one of the few that I would consider a friend, um, as opposed to the many people I've met, musicians who I am friendly with, but I would consider, you know, professional colleagues. Mark's a, Mark's a friend, you know, a little distant, but we're, you know, we're in touch. And this was a really great return and with these two guys since they've been playing together with Abercrombie and in various other contexts Drew Grass has been playing with with um, with Mark for a couple of decades they had a group with Abercrombie originally the I mean the Abercrombie's quartet was originally Mark Copeland's quartet um, and originally had Billy Hart on drums instead of Joey yeah but that started in 96 was second look I think and then they did another album on Pirouette but then when it came to ECM you know it's you know Mark's name isn't as big so they decided to push this under Abercrombie but really it's a collaborative group and the same thing applies to Gary Peacock's trio with with Joey and with Mark but anyway this album is just you know I, I hate to say it but pretty much any album that Mark puts up is going to end up on my best list Steve Kahn is the weirdest thing because he had a long break from solo recording from about 96 to 2007. And, you know, then suddenly he released this album called The Green Field with Jack DeJohnette and John Patitucci that was just great. Steve is a guitar player, for those who don't know him, who began his life in the 70s as a session player so you can hear him on albums like Billy Joel and Steely Dan and that kind of stuff. Did he do but work he also, on CTI? Uh no. No, he, okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't he may have recorded on a couple albums on CTI but largely not. He was his own albums. He did three very fusion type albums but fusion in the vein of like the Brecker brothers so kind of, you know, the downtown kind of New York thing. Um, so, you know, it, it more, more funk and, and that kind of thing. But anyway, so he, but his guitar tone, uh, he was playing a Telecaster and it was mixed way up in the mix. And I mean, it, it you know, it, they were great albums, but, but it was weird about how that happened. But then he did this album in 1980 called Evidence and it was a solo record in that he played only guitar and some tracks he layered multiple layers of guitars, but it was a solo guitar record and you know five standards on the front end and the second side an 18 minute monk medley that's still one of the best things he's ever done but it was a signal of a very major paradigm shift in the way he played that then became really obvious the next year when he released eyewitness which was a quartet with drummer steve jordan who's better known now for like playing with guys like Keith Richards and John Legend, or not John, uh, John Mayer, um, and um, uh, uh, my brain's playing. Uh, um, Anthony Jackson, the tremendous contrabass, electric contrabass player, and uh, Manu, uh, Manolo Badrena, who was a percussionist who first probably came to big renown with Weather Report in 76, 77. Anyway, uh, this was a real change because he moved from a, the, his, his telly to, you know, like a Gibson ES-335 and went for like a cleaner, warmer tone kind of sound. But also he became a much sparer guitar player where every note counted. And that was the beginning of what led to where he is now. Um, you know, it was a real shift in the entire approach to how he did things. So he started releasing albums in 2007, and, you know, we've, we've been in touch, you know, we've had a couple of phone calls and stuff, and almost every album 
uh, starting in, uh, gee, let's see, just a minute, I'll, I'll tell you, but he's ever starting around 2009 or so, I guess it would be, um, or no, 2011, Parting Shot, which was a double entendre because he's a big hockey fan, so, uh, but also it was meant to be his last recording, a number of reasons, you know, I mean, the challenges of being an independent guy without um, any kind of major label support behind him, he releases all this stuff on Tone Center, and they do a good job, but, you know, they don't put a lot of energy into promotion, I don't think. Um, I think Steve has left doing that, as many musicians are. Um, but every album was going to be his last one. And then, you know, a year and a half down the road, I get an email from him saying, guess what? And what he's been doing, though, since um, uh, Borrowed Time, which is a 2007 record, is he has basically defined himself as the preeminent Latin jazz guitarist. And when I say Latin jazz, I don't mean like sort of a, a dilettante on this, you know. He uses uh, a drummer, usually Dennis Chambers now, and two percussionists. And Steve is in person and on his instrument and in his arrangements, which he does himself and with Rob Mounsey, a great keyboard player who's been with him for years. The most meticulous guy I know. I did a liner note for him for uh, Backlog, his second to last record, the one before this uh, current one, Patchwork. And it was a great experience. I told him he was on my bucket list of guys I'd love to do liner notes for. But, you know, it was a struggle getting them right because he was so meticulous and so very specific about what he wanted. Um, and his music reflects that. And so... When you talk about a, a guy like him doing Latin versions, let's say, of Epistrophe, uh, a classic Thelonious Monk tune, or or Nat Coleman tunes, you know, they are real reinventions, and you'll have not heard anything like them. And, you know, his, his albums have become great because his, his own playing is tremendous, both as an accompanist and as a soloist, but also... He brings in great guests, like on this, uh, the current record, Patchwork. You know, Randy Brecker comes in on flugelhorn on uh, on one particular lovely tune. Bob Mincer on tenor on another. Um, he also did an unusual thing in that a, a guy named Jorge Estrada wrote the closing tune on the album, but it was for himself, and Steve Kahn was supposed to play on it. And the, the project never happened. But there was this recording, and so Steve said, like, let's take the recording of you, and then let's add my guys into it. So it's kind of like, you know, combining sessions from years apart. And it's it's um, a tremendous uh, closing tr track called Hurricane, Hurricane Claire. Um, okay. So anyway, it's an amazing record, um, and 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 I expect nothing less from Steve, and I never get anything less. Lovely, yeah. I enjoy his playing a lot, as well as uh, the the Copeland playing. I love that stuff, man. Yeah. Um, so listen, uh, since we started late, I want to make sure that I leave enough time in the show to play some of this yep. stuff. Let's. Um, Anything else particular you want to talk about? Well, yeah. Let's let's tie this up in maybe fifteen or. So yep. minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you and I can talk forever about the music we love, but yes. I want to touch on the Bill Frisell and Thomas Morgan, and I would oh. also like to touch on. <laughs> speaking of Frisell, um, the Zorn record mm -hmm. that uh, came out—he came out with several albums this year, um, yep. as he always does. But the uh, Nove Cantici per Francesco di Assisi album with uh, Julian Lage and Gian Riley. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing. Good. No. My wife is good at this because she's into opera, so like her, her ability to articulate Italian and other stuff is tremendous. I, can't, I'm, I I'm cannot happy. speak Italian. I'm half Italian, quarter English, quarter Irish, but I, I, oh, okay. I do not know how to speak is, anything but Chicago. Okay, but my, my wife is 100% Irish, um, like off the boat Irish, um, which has, you know, it's it's interesting 
things when you're talking about a guy like me who's you know a canadian and anyway i'd like to talk about those two records but i'd also like to talk a little bit briefly about the ecm download streaming only releases oh yeah 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 yeah. please do yeah no specific ones but just i can mention a couple but the bottom line is ecm recorded records the Herald, a German label that celebrated its 50th year in 2019. And uh, to do that, amongst the things they did, was they reissued their very first album by pianist Mel Waldron um, uh, called Free at Last, except for once, and ECM does not do this, they added additional takes. And that's a rare thing for ECM. In fact, I think it may be the only time they've ever done that. So, but what they also did was they've got a pile of albums that have been sitting there and have never seen release in the digital realm, so not on CD, not in any digital format. And so what they did was they remastered them and in a high resolution, and then you know downsampled them for you know certain streaming sites and for all these other places, but made them available for sale as download only releases. And I mean there were over thirty of them released at about seven a week. I think in July, and every every week I pulled my hair out because I just look at how much money I was spending. Because um, of <laughs> course, you know, I was buying all this stuff. But I mean, there are albums that I've been waiting to hear. I've had vinyl to CD rips for years. Jackie Jeanette's Two Directions album with John, albums with John Abercrombie, um, uh, Untitled and New Rags being two. Double Image, the the album Dawn where. Uh, I love that album. Love uh, that album. Yeah, Dave Samuel. I mean, a a, a two mallet group. uh, You know, so two vibraphone slash marimba players, a bass player, and a drummer. Um, And speaking of vibes, the album Gallery, which was always a favorite from 81, with Oregon's Paul McCandless, um, Dave Samuels, I believe, is the one, um, um, David Darling on cello, uh, Ratso Harris on bass and Michael De on drums. I think, yeah. There's a, there's just a, there's a whole pile of stuff that they released. Ratso, Ratso Harris. That's not. Was he with Steve Kuhn? Um, no, I'm not sure, but he was okay, with the net at yeah. very different times. Okay. Anyway, bottom line, there's a pile of them. There's like nonfiction from Steve Kuhn. There's Art Londa, Rubisa Patrol, Desert Marauders, Renorama. Bobo Stenson's first group before he started doing his own solo stuff. Two Enrico Rav albums, the great Italian trumpeter. Another one that's been overlooked totally is this bassist from Germany named Adelhard Roydinger. And he made an album in 82. His one album for ECM called Schatzeit. And it's spectacular. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff. There's a couple of things that, I mean, put this way, I bought almost all of them. And the only ones I didn't buy were the ones that I just don't listen to much. Like, they released Just Music, one of their early, really free albums, uh, sort of in Derek Bailey territory, but very spare. Um, and I didn't pick up um, uh, Wolfgang Downer's output, because part of it I like a lot, and part of it makes me want to throw it against the wall. So, you know, <laughs> but I mean, I missed buying probably about, I don't know, Three or four maybe would be it, I guess, if I think about it. So anybody looking for the ECM titles that have never been on CD, uh, go to your favorite uh, online shop, or if you do streaming, preferably places like Tidal or Deezer, so you get fuller high resolution instead of Spotify's compression. Um, But... Even better would be to buy the downloads because you can get them in high res and you're giving more money to the label and therefore to the artists. So anyway, that's what I have to say about those. The the whole ECM reissue thing was just like for me, um, monumental. Um, I couldn't uh, just like it had to happen at some point and I'm so glad they did it. Very cool, man. Um, Okay. So the Zorn. Yeah. Uh, well, Lodge and Riley uh, did an album that was part of John Zorn's last box set, which had all kinds of problems because Pledge Music basically screwed up all artists. Um, but he put out uh, what was effectively his third Masada book. It was called Bariah, 
uh, and it consisted of I think it was ten, or maybe it was eleven records. It was um, it was ten, and then um, they've all been released individually. There's an eleventh uh, bonus disc with exactly. uh, with Tayborn and yeah. uh, what's his name, Vadim, the, the two piano players. Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, just a second, I'll look it up. I'll get it. Uh, oh, Vadim Nesolovsky. Nesolovsky. What he said. Yeah. Anyway, that's called it. But but yeah, and 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 the great thing is every album's by a different group, and you know the uh, Julian Lodge and the Ian Riley one uh, was tremendous. Uh, I'm a big fan of Julian Lodge. I mean, this is a guy who first came to attention about the age of ten when the great late jazz guitarist Jim Hall heard him. And he went on to be uh, connected to Gary Burton, the vibraphonist, for a number of years. Um, but, and he started releasing solo albums. And from the very first solo album, what was really clear was this is a guy who was largely coming out of the mainstream tradition, or at least so you thought. But that was far from everything that described him. And he was not going to be pigeonholed when he made albums. And virtually every album he's done has been different unless he's using the same lineup, you know? Um, so I'm a big fan of Julian. I've seen him live a few times, and I saw him do a duo with Nels Klein, the guitar player who is an amazing left-of-center jazz guitarist, but is also the lead guitar player for Wilco, um, just to show that musicians don't, you know, have, have broad tastes and broad interests in playing, and no, Nels Klein is not moonlighting in Wilco. He loves playing with Wilco. Anyway... So Julian Lodge and Gian Riley, and then when you add Bill Frizzell, who was in the uh, Book of Bariah with, his, with the group called uh, Gnostic Trio, which is vibes, guitar, and harp, and is this is like their sixth recording. It's called Netzach, and it's, it's just tremendous. So the idea of putting Bill together with Julian and um, Gian has been great, and so much so that I think Bill is going to be doing some duo tours with Julian this year, uh, in fact. Oh, that would be nice. Uh, love to see that. As far as Bill is concerned, the Epistrophe record, which is the second release from the same Village Vanguard live recordings that spawned um, Small Town, uh, I think it was two years ago, I believe it was 2018. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is more of the same, but I mean... Bill's, I wouldn't call Bill like my friend. I think that would be assuming too much, but we know we meet, we've met a lot of times. And I don't think that there is another musician, and he has many people he plays with regularly, but I don't think there's another musician who so closely mirrors Bill, not just in his approach to playing, but in his personality, uh, as Thomas Morgan, um, one of the most underspoken guys, you know. Um, and I mean, you know, Bill is an underspoken guy too, but because he's a big name, he's forced to speak more than he probably likes. Um, but you know, it's that, that duo record is just, uh, the epitome of sublime understatement. Um, so, the, and, and the one with Zorn is, is similarly surprising, you know, I mean, Zorn has such breadth in what he does, you know, I mean, he does, you know ear-piercing stuff to some of the most beautiful music you hear anywhere. Um, so I find it, you know, he's, I don't follow him as closely as I used to because, frankly, he releases so much stuff, you know, it's impossible to do so. Oh, I know. I just started collecting him this, I'd say, 2012, and I have about 50 CDs, and they're all just from this century. I don't have anything from last century by him. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and... I mean, you know, the the Masada Quartet he had with Joey Barron and, and Greg Cohen on bass and the great Dave Douglas on trumpet was just a mind blower. I saw them live once and it was really just, you know, one of the great shows in my in my lifetime. Um, but, you know, but but he and he, you know, he, but he's not always in my wheelhouse. You know, like I find the, you know, like brain killer. Uh, or painkiller, sorry, uh, is a bit over the over the edge for me. 
Well, I got to be honest. I I'm not a big fan of noise or skrunk. I'm just yeah. not. Uh, yeah, I sit through it with Art Ensemble because there's a lot of other stuff. Art Ensemble Chicago with Sun Ra, yeah. um, with Zorn sometimes. But yeah, I'm not too interested in that kind of stuff. But you hit the nail on the head. He has written some of the most beautiful music uh, ever. Just yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, he's an amazing guy. Um, we so had a, we know. had a beautiful thing here a couple of years ago, John. Um, oh. The Art Institute of Chicago, mm-hmm. beautiful museum, from eleven in the morning, I think, or noon until they closed at five. A day of John Zorn. Oh my God! Oh, I saw the Gnostic Trio in the room with uh, Impressionist paintings, Monet. Yeah. Uh, it was it was beautiful. I had to listen to Riley and um, oh, no. I had I had to listen to Gian Riley and uh, Julian from another gallery because it became real apparent real quick as the day grew that you weren't going to because some of these were held in a small gallery and I was so frightened they had some sculptures that people were going to knock stuff over. I mean they were right. jam yeah. anyway. I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. Beautiful, no, no. beautiful. And I thought, sorry, when you said Riley and I got all, ooh, I thought you meant Terry Riley because Terry Riley has recorded. Oh, his one. dad. Yeah, no, I didn't see his dad, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would, I would be, I, I don't know if, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I would be like if I was able to see Terry Riley perform live. No kidding. You know? Well, listen, uh, before we top this off here, or uh, tie this up here, um, <laughs> or end it, or begin mm. it, um, are there any other things you wanted to mention from uh your list yes absolutely and and for anybody who is on the list and who happens to be listening if i didn't mention you i'm sorry i mean because everything's great all right this is a little weird but um i don't have any editing equipment at home and i post these d uh these videos on youtube these interviews um we've got 13 minutes left on this disc so okay we'll we'll be done long before that okay go yeah. So I wanted to mention Stefan Thielen's Fractal Guitar on Moonjun Records. Um, Stefan is the, the leader of a band called Sonar. And um, if you're a fan on ECM of Nick Barch, you need to hear these guys. It's basically two guitars, bass, and drums. Similar territory, but different. Um, Fractal Guitar is a little more broad in its, its picture. It's not as narrowly focused as Sonar is, but it's... And I think it's a landmark guitar record. Um, King Crimson, of course, released a lot of stuff this year, but the Heaven and Earth Live and in the Studio gets my vote as the best value for your money that includes the most amount of music in a box set that I've ever seen. Um, and the other thing is, it's really good stuff. Um, but some single recordings that I think need to be mentioned um, in the jazz world, um, I'd like to bring up guitarist Reza Bassi, um, a throw of the dice on Whirlwind. He's a guitar player I've been following for about 15 years, and he just keeps changing. And it's a he's he's Pakistani by uh, from where and and it's part of who he is. Um, so that's one. Jasper Blom, a tremendous saxophonist from uh, the Netherlands, um, with his long-standing quartet did a live album called polyphony um but with some guests uh it's particularly tremendous matt tyletson a norwegian bassist reveries and revelations on hugo um a sort of solo bass record that's uh both beautiful and oblique at the same time um a curious one a piano player named eric lewis who goes by the name ilu uh cubism it's on Kurt Rosenwinkel, the jazz guitarist, who's one of my favorite, his hardcore records, Elu plays Rosenwinkel. If you want to hear a pianist approaching Kurt's writing, it's quite something. And then there's the album Kurt did with another great guitar player, Tim Mutzer, and a drummer whose name escapes me at the moment. But their recording um, uh, from this year um, called uh, Searching the Continuum. The band is called Bandit 65 on Hardcore. It sort of relates to Rosenwinkel's 2003 album Hardcore, but in a very different way. Um, Last couple of jazz ones, Antonio Sanchez and Migration, uh, Lines in the Sand. Antonio Sanchez, best known for playing drums with guys like Pat Metheny. Um, 
since he's formed his migration band, um, his writing and the band concept has grown incrementally with each release. I saw him this summer in Montreal, and it was one of the best shows I've seen probably in this decade or the last decade. Um, this is a, a, a really tremendous record. Um, and last one is Socrates Sinopolis Quartet. Uh, so, uh, Socrates, so, ah, Socrates plays a lira, which is a bowed instrument, and, and it's a piano-based drums, but with this Greek instrument added in, and this is their second record, and it's something. Now, as far as the non-jazz stuff, obvious, Abbey Road. Um, once again, Giles Martin nails it. Um, but another guy who did a great remix is Tony Bisconti, who remixed David Bowie's Space Oddity and um, actually made it better, which is an amazing thing in itself. Um, Leonard Cohen's what appears to be final record, Thanks for the Dance. If you liked his last one, you, if uh, you want it darker, which was put together by his son, um, but came out before, just before Leonard died. Um, this is like taking fragments of stuff that Leonard was working on, sometimes just spoken poetry. And it's dark, deep, and everything you'd want. Um, Roseanne Cash, she remembers everything. I'm a huge fan, and she just keeps going. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just looking at my list. I did listen I to some of that, too. That's yeah. lovely. Yeah, and, and some other sort of country-leaning stuff, Rodney Crowell's album, Texas. I've been a Rodney Crowell fan for 30 years. 40 years, yikes. And, you know, and also Bruce Hornsby's Absolute Zero, which is a pop record by a guy who's best known as a pop guy. But, man, is it ever experimental. Um, it's probably his most, its broadest reaching record that he's ever put out. And if you all you want to hear is, that's, is the way it is or uh, Mandolin Rain or something like that, well, this may not do it, but for anybody who's looking to hear a guy who's stretching a bit a lot actually this is it absolute zero by bruce hornsby ashley hutchings gone missing ashley hutchings was one of the original members bass player and singer in fairport convention the uh, traditional british folk rock group um, that's gone through multiple changes his solo recordings are hit and miss but gone missing which is tracks from two albums that he did that were particularly good um, by Gloucester, um, Docs, I Sat and Wept, and I can't remember the name of the follow-up. Anyway, this is sort of other stuff from those sessions. Amazing. Last two, uh, Buddy and Julie Miller break down on 20th Avenue South. Uh, husband and wife team Buddy Miller played with Robert Plant and the Band of Joy. It's produced multiple people that we, you probably know. Julie's been a singer-songwriter for many years, and this is their first recording together. Uh, in 10 years and it's just a big winner um, no man love you to bits no man the duo of Tim bonus the singer and Stephen Wilson the yeah. everywhere guy very pro surprisingly progressive leaning and and a really nice record from this guys unexpected and the last thing I'm going to mention sorry two more I think I've got time XDC has Dukes of stratosphere surrounded about right oh hell yeah. So, yeah 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 Stephen Wilson remixes XTC becoming a psychedelic rock band in the mid 80s. Amazing stuff. And then Van Morrison, Three Chords and the Truth. You know, he's a guy who keeps putting out records, and you go, yeah, these are good, you know. But this is particularly good, and it harkens back to his sort of early 80s days of um, beautiful vision and um, inarticulate speech of the heart. So, you know, really stands out. Um, and last one, Frank Wyatt and Friends Zeitgeist. That's another progressive one. Frank Wyatt was part of Happy the Man, which was a one of the most important, I think, progressive rock bands that came out of the U.S. in the early in the mid seventies. Yeah, because they were connected more to Gentle Giant and to the Canterbury scene than they were the typical guys that people were following, like Yes and Genesis. And this is a really nice record. Just that's all I can say. It's a really nice record. So that's about it. Everything else is great. That's on the list. If I didn't mention it, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, uh, I've, I've 
dominated this conversation already way too much. <laughs> so well, no, this is this was more. Yeah, no, no, this was more as opposed to a conversation interview. This was more you telling us about your your top picks. So don't feel yeah. you dominated at all. That's what it was okay. about. Well, yeah, I man. hope I've given I hope I've given people enough stuff, and I hope I've given some things to think about because. Um, Oh, I have to add, Partisans, Neat to Neat, their final record, Neat to Neat, Nighty Night. Um, Julian Siegel on sax, Phil Robeson on guitar, Thaddeus, oh man, his last name, I think it's Kelly, and on bass and Gene Jackson. This is their swan song, a live recording uh, at the Vortex in, in London. And um, they are another group that crosses a lot of... Uh, 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 they, they cover a lot of territory and uh, I, I just I would recommend then um, unhesitatingly okay I think I'm done uh, man <laughs> it, it is such an honor to to have you call in and talk to us I'm sure our uh, listeners uh, I always get responses to how you know informative this was talking to you usually and um, this this one you know i think i think i i can see listeners just like grabbing notepads and writing frantically night writing down titles and artist names <laughs> so thank you so much in those last slightly less than hour and a half Yikes. we're, we're going to get to uh, some of this music but because of the way we had to do this today folks uh the phone line wasn't working i had to download firefox onto my laptop so i'm going to have to leave you with some sounds for a minute while we say goodbye to John, and don't go away. We're, we'll be back with music in about 60 seconds. So, John, thank you so much for calling, and we'll probably talk again within a, a short while of, about more magical music. Anytime you want, man. I have a, I have a, this, is a, this is sort of becoming a nice thing to do on a Saturday afternoon. Right on. Me too. Yeah, and our listeners love it. So um, I won't be able to say goodbye to you offline because once we say goodbye, yeah. it's unhooked. I'll write to you later a uh, couple things I wanted to tell you. So, okay. Okay, man. Cheers. All right. Bye for now. All right. Bye-bye, John. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Until next time. Until next time. All right, listeners, as I said, uh, a little goofy here today in the studio trying to get stuff to work, but we got it working, and... Uh, we actually had to do that on the Facebook chat thing today. <laughs> so um, let me leave you with a little bit of sound for a minute while I switch things over here in the studio. Mm -hmm. 